You say, oh, you're just eight years old. Well, I, I still felt the flames. I, I realized that night that I was as lost as a goose in a hailstorm, I guess you'd say, but I was lost. I knew that if I died that night without giving my heart to Jesus, that I would land in hell. Now somebody go get that boy out of that car because he needs to hear this. Because uh, he's going to sit on holy ground, he needs to come in and, and listen to what's being said. So somebody go jerk him out of that car and get him in here. And if he won't come, you tell him that I'm not going to give him that $5 bill, I promise to give him here. If that don't get him out, then he, just, he can sit there. Amen? Amen. I'll get to talk their language, I guess. <laughs> but I'll tell you, when I was eight years old, I knew what it was like to be lost because all of a sudden I realized I'm not safe. I heard a woman testify today. She was raised in the Catholic Church. And she said, uh, for years, you know, she would talk to the priest, and she would talk to Mary, and, and uh, she thought, you know, she was praying to the right one. And then she got real deathly sick in the hospital. And she said she realized that the priest couldn't help her, that uh, his prayers weren't helping And she realized that uh, uh, Mary wasn't answering her prayers either. And so she, for the first time, she cried out to God himself. And she said, God, help me. She said, she, would, she had, uh, was pregnant with her twins, and she was losing so much blood, and they couldn't stop it. And they had to take her into emergency surgery. And she was afraid that she was going to lose them children, of course. And she was afraid that she was going to die because of all the blood that she'd lost. And so she began to call upon God. And she began, for the first time, instead of praying to Mary or praying to a priest, and she said, God began to hear her. She said, God was there all the time, of course. And she said, through the process of, a, of several years of trying to find the right church, she left the Catholic Church. She, didn't, she wouldn't go for about six years straight. She was still a Catholic. But she said she realized there's something more there. The Catholic Church just did not hold all the answers for her. Now, this was the way she was raised. So, through a process of seeking Bible studies and going to different Bible studies and different ones, she went to one church, she said, the pastor, all that he could say was, well, just confess Christ, you'll be fine. You, you read the scripture, just confess that he's Lord, and you're, uh, for, uh, you're asking forgiveness for your sins, that's all you got to do to be saved. And he'd say, you did that, didn't you? And she said, yeah. He said, well, you're saved. She said, no, I'm not. Because I didn't see, I didn't feel any difference. He said, what am I saved from? I, I'm old-fashioned enough to believe that when you get saved, you feel saved. Right. Well, yeah. on, right. There's two ways I know the devil is after me. First of all, and that tells me that I'm saved if he's after me. And another thing, I must have something that's genuine or he wouldn't be after it. And, a, and another way I know that I'm saved is because I feel saved. I feel saved. If you don't feel saved, there's something wrong with your salvation. You say, well, you can't go on feelings. No, you can't go on feelings as far as, far as faith is concerned. But I believe you better feel saved. If you don't have enough confidence in your heart to, to feel saved, the Bible says don't cast away your confidence, which has great recompense and reward. So we need confidence that our heart is right with God. The Bible says our heart witnesses with God, or our spirit witnesses with God's spirit, that we are the child of God. Now if you can witness, your spirit can witness with God's spirit tonight that you're a child of God, and you've got something going. You've got something genuine. And you probably feel safe. But if you have a doubt in your heart tonight that, that you're saved, then you're probably not. Pretty simple. Yep. Amen. Amen. This woman has good testimony. You know, there's a lot of people around you every day that you come in contact with who feel like their religion 
is going to get him there. Right. But the devil don't care how religious you are tonight. In fact, he would rather that you be religious. Right. Oh, no. I can reach a, an old drunkard down at, a, at the bar or pull him out of a gutter and I can win him to the Lord much quicker and much easier than I can if I go down to some religious organization or some religious church and try to straighten them out on the scriptures or try to go to some religious order who believes in some strange God somewhere and try to tell them they're serving the wrong God. You see, that's, that's what's wrong with the world today. They're too religious. We've got so many relig worldwide religions that are growing fast. But we need the truth tonight. Because Jesus said, you know the truth and the truth will set you free. Amen. Someone said, well, you have to sin a little every day. I, I can't find that in the scripture. Because what I read in, in Romans chapter 6, where it says that uh, I'm no longer a servant to sin. That's not my topic tonight. I'm just warming up. But you can read that later. Romans chapter 6. He said, if you use yourselves servant to sin, you become a servant to sin to whom you yield yourself to obey. Whether to sin or whether to righteousness. But I'm no longer bound to sin. If I had to sin every day, I'd still be bound to sin. My response to a, a, a good fellow, a good Baptist fellow that used to live next door to me, and he, he had that uh, lodged in his religious brain. Well, you have to sing a little every day. None of us are perfect. I said, yeah, that's right. None of us are perfect. But you don't have to sin every day. If the Lord saves you, you're no longer a servant to sin. Oh, you got to sin a little every day. Everybody sins every day. I said, well, what happens if you go the whole day, and you've been pretty good that day, you, everything's worked out pretty good, and the days went pretty smooth, you haven't got angry, you haven't said a cuss word, you haven't drank any alcohol, you haven't done anything with these things, you know, and you're laying there on your bed at night, and you're thinking, mm, this, this day's been pretty good tonight. You think, oh, I didn't sin today. What are you going to do? Let out a cuss word? Make sure that you sin? He said, well, I have never looked at it that way before. I said, oh, but you got to, he said, oh, you got to sin a little every day. I said, no, that's, that's just something that's, that's got your mental block on that. You don't have to. Because if you had to, you'd be a servant to it. That's right. Oh, but I'm not a servant to sin. That's right. I don't have to. But the Bible tells me it. Now it and have to two different things. I never passed English very well in in, in school. You can probably tell that. Uh, I was when in English class, brother, I was studying aerodynamics. Now, how far an every airplane would fly across the room. When the teacher was teaching on adjectives and, and adverbs and all that other stuff. And I didn't know the difference between any of it. I just I just knew how to read, you know, just about it. But, and how far a spitball would fly. So I didn't do very well in English. I barely passed. And the only reason that the teacher passed me was to get rid of me. He didn't want me back. So, I guess that's kind of a bad lesson, you know, to give some of our young people. They just be so bad in school, they want to get you out of there. Come on. <laughs> But do your best, because someday you're going to need it. Someday you're going to use that English. I found out several years later, you're going to need that English. Amen? That's why I married a good uh, good wife. She's smart in English. You know, she corrects all my writing. Hello? Amen. Thank God for them good wives. The ninth chapter of Matthew. All right. Let's stand for a minute. We've got these prayer requests. We've got the name of the devil, or however you, whatever you call him, tonight. We're going to use the ninth chapter of Matthew and some scriptures there for our text tonight.
But I want you to know tonight that you can have victory over them. And you do have victory over them because he's already been defeated. Amen. You see, he's a bluff. The Bible says he walks around as a roaring lion. It doesn't say he's a roaring lion, but he walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Who he may devour. Are you going to let him devour? If you let him, he will. Hello? All right, I want you to form a line. And we're going to walk over these pieces of paper here. What, whatever's on there, God knows all about it. And we're going to say, in Jesus' name, I claim the victory. In Jesus' name, I have the victory. In Jesus' name, the victory is mine tonight. Glory to God. I'm beginning to feel better already. How about you? Amen. In Jesus' name, he, the devil is defeated tonight. Amen. He's under our feet. Glory to God. The devil is under our feet tonight. Right. Praise God. We have the victory. We are victorious. In the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Put your heel on the devil tonight. Amen. Because that's where he belongs. Under our feet tonight. Praise God. God bless you tonight. Just go ahead. Just walk on it. And... <laughs> Praise God. Glory to God. But the Lord is good. His mercies endure forever. We don't deserve His mercies and His grace. There's nothing we can do to actually earn it. But there's one great thing that we can do to receive it. Did you get that? There's one great thing we can do to receive it tonight. We can't earn it. We can't deserve it. We don't deserve it. But there's one thing we can do tonight to receive it. And that's belief. Belief. Jesus said, if you believe, you shall receive. So tonight, if we believe what God has said, that's 99% of the battle that has been accomplished in our favor tonight. Believe what God has said. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. The ninth chapter of Matthew, let me read a, a few portions of, of this chapter. In verse 35, now if you want to later read this whole chapter, it's got several miracles in here. It's got a lot of good things that Jesus said. About how he had power on earth to forgive sins. About Jesus going by and seeing a man named Matthew and said, Come follow me. And he arose and followed him. Come on. It's got a story about the publicans and sinners when Jesus was sitting in a certain house. They came down, sat with his disciples, and they accused him of eating with publicans and sinners. Critics sitting around criticizing everything that Jesus did. Let me tell you something tonight. There's a lot of people that are sitting around criticizing the church tonight. They're still at it. And we don't need any criticism in the church. Hello? We got enough criticism outside the church. But let me tell you something, there's a lot of criticism in the church too. Yes, there is. Come on. There's a lot of folks that think that maybe you're a little too fanatical. Maybe you're just a little bit offbeat. Maybe you're just a little bit over the edge. Hello? Can you talk about that? Hey, come on. <laughs> Maybe you're just a little bit too excited. So calm down a little bit. You're just getting too excited about this thing, you know? I mean, it'll all work out. We're all on the same place. You heard that before. We don't have to be so excited. We don't have to speak in tongues anymore. Ever hear anybody say that? We don't have to jump around anymore while well, we've graduated from that. 
that why we're getting so many homosexuals in the pulpit? Come on, come on. Is that why we're getting so many pedophiles in the pulpit? Come on. Hello? Is that why there's so much corruption and, and lying and cheating on wives and husbands and in, in the ministry? Hello? Come on now. Come on now. Is that why we got so we got so loose? We don't need tongue talking anymore. We don't need the Holy Ghost anymore. That was just to get the early church started. Hello? Come on, brother. <laughs> we don't need that anymore. You see, those that say that, you can pretty well tell. The power is gone. Because Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, He said, But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and in the uttermost parts of the world. You needed that. Not just to get started, but for a, to be, have the power to witness. We can't effectively witness to this world who is bound in spiritual darkness without the Holy Spirit in the church. Come on. Come on. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to combat the power of the enemy because he's not going to back off just because you got lace around your collar. Just because you're nice to the devil. Be nice to him. Don't stir him up. Come on now. We don't need that excitement anymore. What we need is to go back to God's Word. What the way Jesus started it is the way He intended it to stay. He's no respecter of persons. I, I read in the scripture. What he done for the early church, he said the latter church would have even more. Even more, that's right. The glory of the latter church, he said, would be greater than the former. All right, come on. So God is doing greater things and increasing the power because the enemy is working overtime because he knows that his day is short. He knows that the coming of the Lord is near and he's working overtime. Amen. He's already got the world where he wants them. Yep. To see. Yep. He's working on the religious folks. That's right. In fact, he'd like to get the whole world religious. In fact, that's his goal in Revelation and, and in the book of Daniel, to get the whole world religious. Because it's religion that's going to bring them together under his power. Yeah. Amen? Come on. He's going to use religion. He's especially going to use the Catholic Church. And the world religions, such as the Muslims and the Islam and the, and the Hindus, and those that, that have millions of followers, to bring them together. Oh, we can live in peace. We can be unified. We can come together and we can form one religion. Be careful now. But if you read through that whole chapter, you'll find a lot of good things in there. In verse 35 is where I'd like to start reading here. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Notice he taught and then he preached. And healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. Because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Isn't that like the world today? They had all these religious people. That all these Pharisees and these Sadducees and these religious, the Jewish priests, Come on. They, had a, they had so much religion around them, it should have been doing the job if religion would do the job. But 
But when Jesus come along, he tore them up. He plowed their field. He stirred them up. He told the truth. And he called them hypocrites. There's hypocrites in the church today. They, and they're hiding behind the skirts of religion. Hello? They're hiding behind doctrines, philosophies. Oh, we got a new book. A lot of good things in this book. If you just read this book, your eyes will be open. Well, does it agree with God's Word? That's right. Come on. If it agrees with God's word, it might be okay. Yep. That's right. Then we've got some big time preachers running around filling their pockets full of money. That's right. Come on. Come on. Deceiving, the Bible says, and being deceived. Yep. He said in the last days there'd be many false prophets. That's right. Come on. If someone they come to town, I wouldn't walk across the street to hear. Hello? Just because they're on TV don't mean they ain't preaching the truth. All right. You better keep your Bible in front of you. There you go. And if you don't agree with God's Word, you better toss it aside. Hello? I don't care how big they are. I don't care how many people flock to their meetings. If they don't agree with God's Word, throw it aside. But here, he said... Jesus had, he was moved with compassion because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Notice what he said. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And I thought for years, brother, I thought that we, I read the scripture and I thought, we are supposed to pray to God that He would send forth labor. Is that how you see that? Yeah. I did too. But then I got to looking at it the other day. And I got to looking and I got to seeing a little bit more there. And I got to realizing, yes, God is the Lord of the harvest. And yes, he wants us to pray to him that he would send for more laborers. But then I got to also seeing that we are lords of the harvest too. Amen. That there is a harvest field of souls around us. And someone like you can reach them. And that we should take charge of the harvest yes. and go out with our sickle and reap. Amen. Bring them in. Yes. He said go out in the highways and the byways that compel them to come in. Amen. See, we're in a highway and a byway here. We're outside the church. We're in a highway and a byway. We're, we're compelling people to come in. We're intimidating them with this tent and with the, the outside noise, music, preaching, <coughs> we're intimidating some because we're out in the highway and the byway. We're out there where they could possibly hear it. When you have a church in here, they can drive by and probably never hear a word. What is the purpose of a tent revival? To take the gospel out. Come on. Come on. To take it to those that are in this harvest that need to be reaped. We need to take charge of the harvest. We need to take that upon ourselves and go out and harvest the souls that will never go in or darken the church door. But some folks will
will never come into the church. No matter how many times you invite them, until you go out to them. Until you take the gospel to them. Until you knock on their door. Or until you corner them in the supermarket. Or wherever they're at. At a ball game or whatever. I'm not saying go to the taverns and sit there and drink with them. Hey, you like to come to church with me? No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> that probably won't work. You won't intimidate them if you do that. But you've got to intimidate some folks. You've got to disturb them in their comfortable lifestyle, in their comfortable setting, and you've got to let them know, hey, wake up. Something's about to happen that's going to affect you, and you're going to be standing at the judgment before God and you're not going to have your name in the Lamb's Book of Life which is the only thing that's going to save you from a devil's hell. Amen. It won't matter about your religion. It won't matter about what you know or what you don't know. But if your name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life when you stand before God the books are going to be open, brother. Yep. And the names you're going to be, God's going to be looking down there and he's going to say, what, what's your name now? No, he's going to know your name. He knows all about you. He's got probably a thousand angels assigned just to you. That's how many angels he's got. He's got millions. He's got multiple numbers of angels that we, that John and Revelation could not even number. He said, thousands of thousands of ten thousands times ten thousands and thousands of thousands. In other words, that means without number, there is no number high enough to number them all. Come on. And the angels, the Bible says, are encamped around about them that love Him and fear Him. The angels are keeping record upon every individual on earth. Amen. And they know exactly where you're at, what you're doing. Mom and Dad may not know it. Aunt and Uncle may not know it. Your children may not know it. Your parents may not know it. Your grandma and grandpa may not know. But the angels know exactly where you're at, what you're doing, what you said, when you said it, the time of day, the date. All of those things are in a record book. Hello? Come on, brother. Oh, good job. That's right. I can, I can prove it to you. It's in the scriptures. And that record book's going to be open. But you see, when you come to Jesus, he blots out all of that. Come on. That's right. Come on. With his blood, he wipes it clear. And he writes your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And he forgets all the previous things, all of your past, and he throws into the sea of forgetfulness, and he remembers it no more. Hello? Hello? But that don't give you a license to sin after you get saved. Hello? Some folks think it does. But that gives you a starting point. You can start free and clear and you can start walking with God without that heavy load of sin, without that heavy load of conviction, without that heavy load, that burden. He took it from you. And He got rid of it. How many remember the night you got saved? You remember? Yep. You remember that night? You remember how free how light you felt. And the old expression goes, walking on clouds and eyes. You felt like your feet were so light. You felt like the, oh, everything was so beautiful. Every, you, you look for mother in law to hug her. Hello? <laughs> My mother got saved and she, she looked for the first black person she could find. Because she hated it. 
and she found one downtown Austin. And she went up to her, she hugged her, she says, oh, I love you, honey, I love you so much. She said, oh, guess what happened to me last night? And that black lady says, I know what happened to you. <laughs> you got saved. You got saved. Yes, sir, you got saved. She said, oh, yes, I got saved. And I love everybody now. You remember that night? You remember how good you felt? Woo. Glory to God. What a wonderful thing. But we are the Lord, the master of our hearts. Let me read a scripture in Mark, Mark chapter 4, real quick for you. And verse 26 through 32. He said, so is the kingdom of God. As if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day. And the seed should, should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. And he says, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God, or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all herbs, and shooteth out great branches, so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. When it is sown, it groweth and become a greater than all the earths. Sunday morning, I, I, I ministered on this, this scripture here. I felt like there was just a little bit more here. The kingdom of God, we take the work of the kingdom so lightly. But it is the greatest work that we could ever do. It is the greatest work that we could ever put our hands to. And it may not be as rewarding at least in this life. But it's the greatest thing that we could ever put any effort into or that we could apply any sweat, any effort at all. When the Word is sown, there's going to be a heart. That's what it's telling us here. When the Word of God is sown, there's going to be a harvest. Woo! Hallelujah. A harvest is coming. We look at America and we think, my, my, my. There's been so much of the gospel preached in America. We should have a harvest. People have become gospel hearted. People don't want to hear the gospel. They have got hardened. But God can break the hardness of the hearts. And God can save to the uttermost, the Bible says. All that come to Him. God is able to save the hardest sin. God is able to break that sinner. Right and bring them down to where they will submit and surrender to God. And sometimes I think that God just likes to show how powerful He is. Sure, God's interested in the little white-gloved Miss Nice, never done much sin type person. Sure, he wants to save them too because they're born lost. And yes, God is interested in the worst drunk, the worst sinner that you could possibly think. But God is no respecter of persons. That's right. And he that believeth receives. Amen. And 
if they don't believe, it doesn't make any difference, you see. Because that is not going to qualify them for salvation, whether how good they've been or how bad they've been. The fact that qualifies them for salvation is if they hear it and they believe it. And they accept it. And they ask God to forgive them. You see, the devil deceived a lot of people for years into thinking, oh, you could never get saved. You could never be a church member. You could never be holy and righteous. You've done too many things. God would never forgive you. I walked out, we were walking around knocking on doors in that neighborhood over there by the church. One of them people said to us that day, Oh, I, I'm just not good enough for the church. I just, you know, I just don't think I could ever, ever fit in. You know, I, I just don't, uh, don't think I could, I could be good enough. That's especially the type of person that God is interested in. That's right. Because the person that says, "Oh, I don't need the church," ah. Uh, I'm pretty good, you know, I'm just as good as old sister so-and-so going down there to the church and shouts all over the church. And, uh, you know, I, I you know, I, she's a hypocrite. And that hypocrite's going to heaven, I guess I am too. Hello? Well, you heard it like that. You see, they're comparing themselves with someone else. The Bible says if we compare ourselves among ourselves, we're not wise. Because someone else's religion is not going to get you closer to God or farther away. It's not someone else's religion. It's not someone else's faith. It's not someone else's life. But it's between you and God. It ain't mom or dad how religious they are. But what about you? Hello? What about you? Where do you stand with God? Is your name in that book of life? Well, my grandma and grandpa, you know, they were pretty good folks. They were church members for years. Mom and dad, they were good folks. What about you? Goodness is not going to get it. Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's the bottom line. If it's not found there, and you're finding yourself in the judgment standing before God, guess what? The trap door is going to open underneath you. You're going to pull the lever. You won't have a second chance. There'll be no time to say, well, Lord, uh, I, 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 I've got this excuse or I've got that excuse. There'll be no excuses. You see, the Bible says in the sixth chapter, verse Corinthians says, today is the day of salvation. Maybe the second book of Corinthians. Today is the day of salvation. In the day that you hear his voice, 